The following audio has been brought to you by Word of Grace Community Church. For more information about Word of Grace, visit wogcc.com. We're going to go ahead and wrap up the series that we've been in for the past few weeks called How to Neighbor. This is Palm Sunday, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in the scripture. But if you're taking notes, write this title down, Eternal Impact. That's what we're going to talk about today as we conclude our series called How to Neighbor, Eternal Impact. I really began to think about this message when I was thinking about this phrase that I've been using a lot lately. We as a church need to make an eternal impact. We as individuals are called to make an impact on eternity. And you've been hearing that a lot lately. But then I kind of slowed down as I was preparing this message. And I began to think, do we really even understand what eternity means? Do we really have a concept of eternity? So how are we supposed to be passionate about something that we don't really even understand? We use the word eternity really loosely. We'll say, man, that waiter took an eternity to bring my check. We'll say, oh, it's been an eternity and a day since I've seen that person. You know, we don't really have an idea of what that means. We can only frame eternity based off of something that's taken us a really long time to experience. You remember when it felt like it was going to be an eternity before you got your driver's license? You remember when it felt like it was going to be an eternity before you got married or an eternity before you had kids and now that you have kids and you are married, you... Anyways, <laughs> we have no idea what eternity really means. We can only frame it based on things that take a long time. The best thing we could come up with to help us understand eternity is a lifetime warranty. That's the best thing we've got is a lifetime warranty. And if you have snap-on tools, you understand lifetime warranty. Well, some of them, not all of the tools because they changed the rules a little bit on us midstream. I remember my father-in-law, he was walking out in the woods one day and he found a sink uh, and there was a faucet attached to it just randomly in the woods. Someone had just decided to dump this sink out in the woods and he was walking along and he found this. And I forget what brand it was. I don't know if it was a Kohler one or not. But I do know that whatever the faucet was, he pulled the faucet out of the sink and it was all damaged. But he looked it up and found out that it had a lifetime warranty on it. And he wanted to see if he could get that faucet exchanged for a new one because the condition it was in. He took it to the store where the retailer was that sold that that, uh, faucet. And he said, hey, I read on the internet this has a lifetime warranty. He said, it sure does, and handed him a brand new one. And I'm like, man, that's the best thing we've got to understand what forever is, is that I guess I could just get a new faucet forever. But we don't really have a concept of eternity. So because we can't understand eternity, how can we be motivated by it? How can we be motivated by something that we don't really understand? How can we be driven to make a difference in something that we don't really understand because we, quite frankly, have never experienced it? We sing songs about eternity We read books about eternity. We watch movies about the afterlife. But the reality is, is that it's not really something we can comprehend. So today on this Palm Sunday, we're going to wrap up this series by looking at what Jesus said regarding eternity and how you and me are called individually and as a church to make an impact on eternity. And I want to start off by saying this because a lot of people struggle with this. There's a lot of people in our day and time that have a hard time believing this. And so I'm just going to put it out there for you that both heaven and hell are real. They're real. It's easy to believe in heaven because that's where all the good stuff is. It's not as easy for some people to believe in hell because they don't like the thought of hell. So when they think about eternity, they want to frame it in what is convenient for them instead of what Scripture says. Jesus talked about heaven a lot, but guess what? He talked about hell a lot too. Heaven is awesome and hell hell is terrible. That's why we use it as a swear word. (laughs) That's why you hear people using hell as a swear word because it means something awful. No one ever says that in a good context. It's always negatively. And we don't understand heaven and we don't really understand hell, but we have little glimpses of what those places look like. And we know that they're attached to eternity. And when we look through Scripture and we read the words of Jesus, or we read throughout the New Testament where the church begins to understand that this is an eternity that we're talking about. This is an eternal decision that we're making for Christ, that our lives are impacting, influence eternity. That's what motivated these people in the book of Acts to be willing to give their lives for the cause of Christ. And they had to have a picture of it. 
They had never tasted it. They had never really experienced it. But they knew that Jesus told them about it. And they knew that Scripture spoke of it. And because of that, they were willing to die in order to let the name of Jesus be proclaimed. But they knew that this earth was only a temporary one, even though they hadn't yet experienced eternity. And they were willing to die for it. They were willing to sacrifice for it. They were willing to be uncomfortable for it and inconvenienced for it because they understood something that you and I need to catch. I don't really understand heaven or hell myself. I I know all the scriptures concerning what the Bible says about those places, and I know that they're very real. And this is not the best scripturally concrete record of what hell is going to be like, but I saw a play once when I was a youth pastor in Arkansas. I'd taken my youth group to one of these kind of general assemblies where different youth groups from different churches all gathered together, and there would be worship, and someone would speak. Well, there was a drama team at this church, and they put on this play. And even though this isn't a doctrinally sound play, it still gives you an idea of what a despair, agonizing place hell would be. And I'll never forget this. It was on the stage, there were three scenes. One was a scene of this young man's home where he was in his bedroom. The next scene on the stage was a scene of him at school by the lockers. And then the last scene was staged as if he were outside hanging out with his friends. And these three scenes that were set up on this stage, they began to have light shown on them as the play progressed. And the first scene was him in his home, and his mother was telling him about how much God loved him. His mother was telling him about how much that God cared about him and how he needed to give his life to Christ, and he didn't want anything to do with God. The second scene, he was with his friends. His friends were trying to invite him to youth group, trying to tell him about Jesus, and then he didn't want anything to do with it. And the third scene... He was out hanging out with friends outside. Same thing, they're trying to get him to come to this event that they were having at their church, and he was just trying to tell them about Jesus and love on this guy, and he rejected Jesus all three times. Now, in the background, raised was a character dressed all in white that you couldn't see his eyes. All you saw was these black circles around his eyes, and he had a black light shining on him, so it looked really cool. And uh, it was just this figure that was lit up with these with this black light, they had these black circles for eyes, and you just saw this figure watching and hovering over these three scenarios. And once all three scenarios finished of this young man rejecting Christ, the lights went down. And then the lights came back up, and they started to play all over again. And he did the same thing. And he rejected Christ again. And then the lights went down at the end of the third scene again. And then the lights come back up, and they do the same thing again. They did this four times. And I'm going, is this a joke? (laughs) did we like come to their rehearsal for some sort of unfinished play this is terrible and i'm confused and the whole time this this shadowy figure that's lit up with these black lights is above watching all of this never interacts with them they don't ever acknowledge that he's there he never says anything he's just looking and watching each each scene and then all of a sudden they go through it the fourth time and about halfway through the play where we had kind of gotten familiar we had kind of memorized it by this point We knew what they were about to do. They all froze in the middle of the play. And then this character that had been watching begins to cry out. And we found out the revelation that the character watching all this was actually the young man in hell. And he was being tortured by replaying all the opportunities before he died that he had to accept Christ. And he was watching this over and over. And I remember vividly that he yelled out, where's all the rock and roll music? Where's all the flames and, 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 and the demons? Where's all the stuff that I had pictured of what hell was going to be? Where, where, where's all that stuff that, that, that I thought it was going to be like? I'm all by myself. I'm here alone. It's dark. Is anyone there? Is anyone out there? Someone, someone, anyone. And I'll never forget the eerie feeling that I got watching that youth group put on that drama because we have this idea of what hell's going to be like, but it's a place of darkness. It's a place where... We are being, uh, where, where people are going to be tormented and seeing that. I, I know that's not a scriptural representation of what we see as hell, but it gives some idea of what absolute torment would be, seeing the opportunities over and over again. And of course, then the, the speaker said, but you know, we're still here and we still have opportunity to accept Christ. But he just got tormented by his choices over and over again to reject God. But listen, folks, hell was not made for people. You know that? 
Hell was not made for people because Matthew 25 and verse 41, Matthew 25 and 41, Jesus says this. He said that hell was for the devil and his angels. It wasn't made for people, but the reality is, is that people will go there because they've rejected God. And people wonder, why would God send people to hell? If God's so full of love, why would he send people to hell? Listen, God doesn't send people to hell, okay? They choose to go there because they choose to reject God because Psalm 14 and 1 says, a fool says in his heart that there is no God. God isn't going to force people to choose him. He's not going to say, you have to choose me. I'm going to make you choose me. No, he gives us that free will to be able to choose him and receive his good gift or to reject his good gift. And so if we choose his good gift of Jesus Christ, we receive forgiveness, we receive reconciliation, then we spend eternity with God. Because heaven is not the streets of gold. Heaven is not the reuniting with family members. Heaven is being with God forever. That's heaven. Amen? All the other things are just side benefits of getting to be in heaven. The real treasure is Jesus, right? There's nothing better than Jesus. Am I right? Isn't that what we see in Scripture? He's preeminent. That means he's above all things and he's before all things. So if Jesus is the best thing ever, then the streets of gold are a perk. Then the mansions are a perk. I'm not after those things. Instead, I want to be with Jesus forever because he's the ultimate prize. He's the ultimate goal. That's heaven is being with Jesus forever. Hell is being without God forever. It's being disconnected from God forever. And based on what we choose, whether we choose to receive the free gift that Jesus has given us or whether we reject him has an impact on not just here on the earth, but on eternity. Second Peter 3 and 9, he says this. Peter says, God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all come to know Jesus. So it's not God's desire that people would perish it's not God's desire that people would reject him, but because God is all-knowing, he knows whether we are going to reject or accept, and he gives us opportunity after opportunity to see his goodness and experience his goodness because he sees eternity, and that's what Jesus sees. Jesus sees eternity. Now, on Palm Sunday, the crowds were coming and adoring Jesus, and they were worshiping him. And let's look at what Scripture says about Palm Sunday and how Jesus views eternity. Go over to the Gospel of Luke and to the 19th chapter. Luke 19, and we're going to read in verse 28. Luke 19 and verse 28. It says this, And when Jesus had said these things, he had just given a parable, he went on ahead going to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that's called Olives, he sent two of the disciples. He said, go into the village in front of you, where on entering, you're going to see a colt that's tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie the colt, bring it here, and if anyone asks you, why are you untying it, you shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away, and they found it just as Jesus said. They were untying the colt, and the owner said, hey, why are you taking our horse? And he said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on the colt, and Jesus sat on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks along the road. People were taking their cloaks off, and they were putting their cloaks on their road as this colt was walking, carrying Jesus. And as he was drawing near, already on the way to Mount Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They shouldn't be doing this. Jesus said this, I tell you, if they were silent, the very stones would cry out. And then Jesus drew near. He saw the city. He looks over Jerusalem, all right? And he wept over it. Jesus cried over the city. He was weeping. He said, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They're going to tear you to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. The people missed Jesus. And because they missed him, he began to weep because they didn't understand why he came. So here Jesus comes into Jerusalem and people began to praise him. People began to lay their coats on the road. They began to cut off palm branches and wave them. And then they would lay them at 
the feet of the colt as it began to walk uh, towards Jerusalem in the streets. And Jesus saw all of this, and after it was all kind of calmed down, and he looks out over Jerusalem, he begins to cry. Because he said, they don't know the hour of their visitation. They don't understand why I'm truly here. Because the people that were worshiping Jesus wanted him to change their temporary condition. They wanted Jesus to change their temporary condition because that's all they were focused on. They weren't looking at eternity. They were thinking about now because the people in Jerusalem were under Roman occupation. So the Romans were running everything. When you paid taxes, you were being taxed and your money was going to Rome. It would be like if we were taken over by another country and they were occupying and all of our taxes went to that country. And their law enforcement ran our country. They were occupying us. Man, we would really want to see that government overthrown so we could have our own government in place. We would want to see our people come back into power, not this foreign power that was controlling us. The Romans were doing this. They were abusing these people, taking advantage of them. And it had been going on for years. And when Jesus came, and when they found out that Jesus was the king, that he was the one that was supposed to come and make all things new, they were beginning to think, he's going to come and overthrow the Romans. He's going to make our lives better. All they were thinking about was their temporary condition. And they were thinking Jesus was the answer to making their lives easier. And that's all they could think about. So they were praising him. Here's the king. The guy who's going to overthrow the Roman government. Our lives are about to be easy. We're about to go back to the way things were. It's about to be better. And they were thanking God for all this. And it caused Jesus to weep when he looked out over the city because they didn't know why he came. They didn't get it. They didn't understand it because Jesus was looking through a different lens than the people were. And we're the same way as these people oftentimes. These people are looking for, through a temporary lens, only looking to Jesus to bail them out of their current pain and sorrow. But Jesus was looking at eternity. And he was saying, don't you realize? Don't you realize that Jesus is more than just the one who will make your life better here on earth? Don't you know that Jesus can do more than just change your temporary circumstance? Jesus saw eternity and it moved his emotions because he knew they couldn't see past their own discomfort. He knew that he was the answer for true eternal freedom. And that's why these people waving branches only a few days later were the same ones that were yelling out, crucify him. These same people that were celebrating Jesus, even some of those that were closely walking with him would be the ones that would end up denying him or betraying him or hiding out of fear for their own lives because... They were worshiping him. They were following him for what he could do for them and not because they saw past the temporary. They didn't see eternity. And it caused them to say when Pontius Pilate says, every year it's our custom to release a prisoner during Passover. How about this murderer Barabbas? Or how about Jesus? I can release one of the prisoners. Who do you guys want? And they said, give us Barabbas. And then they said, what do you want me to do with this Jesus? And what did they yell out? Crucify him. Same people who were waving palm branches and in awe, but then later turned. You see, there has to be a priority made. There has to be a shift made in the way we think in order for us to have an eternal impact. We can't think temporary here on this earth and expect to make an eternal impact and just be consumed with the temporary. We have to have a kingdom priority because a kingdom priority will create an eternal impact. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 33, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Jesus said, why are you wondering about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, where you're going to sleep? Why are you worried about those things? Do birds worry about those things? Jesus asked the question to those that were listening to him teach. He said, do birds worry about that stuff? He said, well, how about the flowers? Flowers, they don't sit there and spin and toil and go, oh, no, where's the water coming from? Oh, no, I hope we get some sunlight. No, nope, they just exist. They have their season. They're planted, they bloom, and then they wither away, just like our lives. And during that entire span of their lives, they don't worry about a thing, and God takes care of them. And he said, how much more valuable are you than a bird or a flower? So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
and all those other things you worry about. He's going to take care of you. He said, don't you think God knows you have needs? And is God not your source? Is he not your provider just like he's the provider for the birds? Just like he's the provider for the flowers? He said, and aren't you much more precious to him and much more valuable to him? He's trying to get us to understand to seek God's kingdom first is to make the kingdom, God's kingdom, not just our temporary discomfort or our temporary position, the priority. He wants his kingdom to be the priority. And are you serving Jesus only to seek a temporary relief or a better life on this earth? Because sometimes serving Jesus will turn some things around in your life. And sometimes when you begin serving Jesus, some things in your life begin to get more challenging. Jesus said, hey, that's going to be you taking up your cross and following me. Amen? That means there'll be some people that may not like you. It may mean that you get ostracized from certain circles. It may mean that you're kind of alone sometimes when you're standing for what's right when everyone else is going a different path. He said, no, he said, it's, it's a narrow way. It's straight and narrow, he said, and there's few that find it. He said, that's the road to eternal life. He said, but the pathway to destruction is broad and it's wide and a lot of people find that path because it's where the majority go. So we want to be those people who stay on that path that God has for us by putting Jesus Christ first in our lives and laying up treasure in heaven because heaven is real and hell is real and eternity is at stake, amen, somebody. I thought you would amen like you believed that. I said heaven is real, hell is real, and eternity is at stake. And, 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 and let me tell you something. If you have Jesus in your life, it doesn't matter what happens here on this earth, your eternity is secure. Uh oh, I thought somebody would shout me down. I thought he was going to do backflips. I said it doesn't matter what happens in your life. If you have Jesus, your eternity is secure. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. You guys should have come to the first service and helped them out a little bit. <laughs> but here's the deal. We get so wrapped up in oh, how am I going to pay this bill? And that's all we think about. We get so wrapped up in, what am I going to do about my marriage? We get so wrapped up in, what am I going to do about this situation at work? And we get so consumed with it when God just wants us to trust Him. And if we find out how God wants us to handle those situations through knowing Him more, then all of a sudden Jesus helps us navigate the temporary but it doesn't change the eternal. If everyone rejects us, if everyone abandons us, if people try to take our lives, if people try to ostracize us, it doesn't matter. If we have Jesus, we can still have peace. That's why we can have a peace that passes our understanding, that guards our hearts and guards our minds through Christ Jesus because our eternity is secure with Him so we don't fear what man can do unto us. Amen? Amen. Because man can kill the body but can't do anything about my soul. Man can't change my eternity only Jesus can change my eternity. I can't change my own eternity. Only Jesus can. And so when I put my, my faith and my hope and my trust in Him, I can rest. And I can go, you know what? I can rest in Christ alone because it's all about Jesus. And now I can have the joy of the Lord that will be my strength to help me endure the temporary challenges. Amen, somebody. Amen. You see, when we look through the lens of eternity, it changes things. When we can see eternity and prioritize eternal things, we stop making everything in our lives about us or making our lives easier. Instead, we say, during the highs and the lows, on the mountains, in the valleys, when I feel like everyone is around me celebrating with me and when I feel alone, that if I have Jesus, I have more than enough. And then I can look through the lens of eternity and I face challenges in life a whole lot better than when I'm only focused on the temporary. If I'm always looking for some band-aid fix and I only cry out to Jesus when I need some help with something challenging, I'm only interested in Him being my plan B to help my temporary life be better. That's not His purpose for your life. His purpose for your life is to bring glory to Him and to win other people to Christ and to make disciples. That's what Jesus said in the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Amen? Amen. You see, here's the deal. We can only see eternity and prioritize eternity when we stop making it about ourselves and we start making it about Him. 
He said in Matthew 6 and 19 through verse 21, he begins to talk about how we shouldn't lay up treasures for ourselves here on earth where thieves are going to steal and moths are going to come and corrupt and rust is going to destroy. We shouldn't heap up treasures for ourselves here on earth to where those things become our priority. He said, but instead lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where a thief can't steal, where a moth can't corrupt and destroy, where rust won't eat it up and corrode it. He says, lay up your treasures there. He said, because in, in, in uh, Matthew 6 and 21 says, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. And we lay up treasure in heaven and in eternity by faith. This is how we do it, all right? So here's, here's the big reveal. Here's the big idea is that we lay up treasure in heaven and impact eternity by faith because we can't access heaven and access hell in our lifetime to where we can take a friend who doesn't know the Lord and we walk up some stairs, I imagine there'd be quite a few, or maybe take an elevator up to heaven and go, look, nice, right, God, right, yeah, nice. All right, now let's go to the other place. And then we take the elevator down, zoom, and we open up the door and we go, hell, bad, right, right. What do you want to do, buddy? We can't do that. We can't physically take them there. We can't physically make people choose. We can't do that kind of stuff. But what we can do is we can invest and impact and influence by faith. That means we do things that we may not be able to actually see the change. We may not be actually able to see the difference necessarily of what is going on behind the scenes. But we are living our lives with a purpose to make an eternal impact. And because of that, we live our lives a lot differently with eternity in mind because we make an eternal impact by activating our faith. That's how we do it. You want to make an eternal impact as an individual? Do it by activating your faith. Now, some people have different definitions of what that word means. Some people hear the word faith and they mean that uh, or interpret that rather by this is my tenets of belief or this is the brand that I am, you know, my faith is, you know, I'm Lutheran, or I'm Catholic, or I'm Presbyterian, or I'm non-denominational, or I'm, you know, whatever. And they try to attach a brand to the word faith, because that's their interpretation or their definition of that word. Some people think that faith means like taking risk, doing things that are uncomfortable, stepping out into something that may yet be unproven, but you have confidence in God. So it took a lot of faith to do this action or that action. Some people interpret the word faith as being something that I have hope in. You know, this is something that I am hoping happen. I'm having faith that this will change. And so we use that word faith a lot of different ways. It's, you know, it's one of our English homophones that is one of those challenging words that oftentimes, depending on the context in which you're hearing it, really affects the way that you truly are receiving that word. So I want to be clear when I say we make an eternal impact by activating our faith. And I want to let Scripture define this word in context for us here of this message by going to Hebrews chapter 11, where the Bible says this in Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Now faith is, so we're about to talk about what faith is. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So even though I can't see it, like I couldn't take my buddy to, you know, like, like I'm doing an open house at heaven and hell, I can't do that. So this is something that's not seen. Eternity is something I don't really understand because I haven't experienced it and I haven't seen it. So I have to impact eternity by faith. But faith, the Bible says, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For it, for by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand the universe was created by the Word of God so that what is seen is not made out of things that are visible. So it wasn't like God had a tool shed and He pulls all these things out of an old tool shed and He makes earth and makes you and me. No, He spoke these things out of nothing. And then they came into existence. Verse 4, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Though he was comm commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he, had taken, uh, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Because without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You see, we make an eternal impact by activating our faith, that assurance 
that of things that are hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God, the Bible says. So that means we need to put action behind our belief. So if people are really going to a real heaven or a real hell, and if this temporal existence has an eternal ramification, then we believe that, and by faith we know that we can make an impact and invest in that, then we need to do that. Amen? You see, faith is you pushing past what is easy. Faith is you pushing past what is comfortable or even what may come natural to you by you stretching yourself by faith beyond your comfort level for the sake of impacting and influencing eternity. Our church is called to make an eternal impact. That means that our church is called to grow, to stretch, and to be uncomfortable to impact and influence eternity. It's not about our four and no more. It's about influencing and impacting eternity eternity. Amen? And we need to be a people who have a purpose and a passion and a focus to do something more than just become smarter about Bible verses. Let's rather become smarter about living the Bible. Amen? Amen. Let's become more engaged with actually being doers of the Word rather than just consumers and hearers of the Word. Because a lot of us have impressive collection of Bible books and Bible topics and Christian literature, and we have heard more sermons than you could shake a stick at. You can go to all the conferences. You can go to all of the worship services and own nothing but Christian music, and you can still live a life without impacting eternity because you make it about yourself. It's time for us to rise up and become the people of God who are willing to get uncomfortable because eternity is at stake. That makes a difference in the grand scheme of eternity. Amen? Amen. So God, show us our selfishness. Help us to see how we focused on the temporary and break our hearts, Lord, for what breaks yours. Just as Jesus stood out over Jerusalem and wept. Break our hearts for what breaks yours, Lord. Let us be drawn to a place of repentance to where we turn away from our selfish ways and we re-engage in the purpose in which you created us with and the commission that you handed us before you ascended to the right hand of the throne of God. Amen, somebody. So what is uncomfortable for you? What is uncomfortable for you? Because everyone's going to have a different definition of uncomfortable because the person sitting next to you, what makes them uncomfortable may not make you uncomfortable. So that means this is not something we can just blanket everyone with. This is something individual that the Holy Spirit is going to deal with you about. Because the Holy Spirit of God is working to convict us and to awaken us and lead and guide and order our steps. And the Holy Spirit is revealing to us our complacency, our apathy, And the Holy Spirit is revealing to us how to neighbor. So when you see this series that we started called How to Neighbor, maybe you are hoping for some great tips and tricks, some life hacks on how to be a better neighbor. You know, start mowing your yard in angles instead of, you know, vertically or, you know, bring them Girl Scout cookies or whatever. Those things take forever to get here. (sighs) When you order them, it's like three month delay and you forget you ordered them. But the thing is, is that being a neighbor is is more than just bringing somebody cookies or mowing their yard or whatever. Those things are great. And I, I want us to do those things, but that's not what this series is about. Just those practical implications, even though there's some great ideas that have been shared, the heart behind it is really what we need to capture. And the only way we're gonna capture the heart to actually engage us to do the practical is going to be if we start looking at eternity. Amen, somebody. So what's uncomfortable? Maybe uncomfortable for you is inviting your neighbor to Easter Sunday. Maybe that's uncomfortable for you. Well, it's time to stretch. It's time to get uncomfortable. It's time to realize you need to make an eternal impact. Maybe uncomfortable for you is paying for a stranger's lunch today. Maybe God's putting that on your heart or maybe there's something he's been telling you to do for someone else that is going to have eternal ramifications. Maybe, uh, because you, you got to get away from this thing of, I have to be some sort of uh, college professor in order to lead someone to Christ. We need to get away from this fear thing that I don't know enough Bible verses. Have you received Christ? If you've received Christ, have you received forgiveness? Have you accepted His free gift of grace? 
then you are equipped to also give it because freely you have received, so freely give. You can only give what you have, amen? I can't give you a million dollar loan, sorry. I'm not remotely close. Maybe you are, but I'm not. We need to talk later. No, I'm kidding. I can't give you what I don't have. But I have Jesus, and if I have Jesus, I should be able to give you Jesus. Because really, isn't that the best thing that we could ever give anyone? And if mowing someone's yard opens up the door to sharing Jesus, or if inviting them to church opens up the door to sharing Jesus, or buying their lunch opens up the door, and maybe you're not the person who gets to actually lead them to Christ, but you were a significant step in the journey of making an eternal impact, and you're laying up treasures in heaven. You're laying up treasures in heaven. You're making an investment, a sacrificial investment to maybe where you wanted to do something and you're having to set that to the side so you can do for someone else, either with your time or either with your talents or either with your finances to where you begin to sacrificially live and sacrificially give of those things to influence and impact eternity. And then God somehow takes care of you when you do that and you live that way. It's when we make it all about ourselves and we try to control everything that things seem to spiral out of control. Amen. So what's making you uncomfortable? It's time to embrace that. It's time to step out and give up the fight that perhaps you've been fighting with God. Maybe that's what makes you uncomfortable is that maybe you don't know Jesus today and you're here or maybe you thought you knew him but you don't really. You just had a form of godliness but no power and maybe God is waking you up to realize that today is your day of salvation where you come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And today is the day that impacts and changes your eternity. And maybe uncomfortable for you is finally surrendering and saying, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me. Save me. I release control of my own life and I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. And it brings you to a place of repentance and acceptance of Jesus. And he says, I love you. I accept you. He says, I forgive you. Whatever it is, you got to do something uncomfortable. Put action to the truth you know. Heaven is real. Hell is real. I want you to go to heaven. Isn't that good? Wouldn't you want your pastor to say that? Amen, somebody. Your pastor wants you to go to heaven. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> but I want you to not just stop there. And you know why I want you to go to heaven? Because I'm concerned about your eternity. That's why I'm your pastor, and I love you, and I care about you, and I pray for you regularly, and I teach you the gospel because I want you to know that nothing's better than Jesus, nothing's greater than Jesus, and I want you to put your faith, hope, and trust in Jesus, not in your own works, but in Jesus. I want you to grow as a disciple of Christ because I care about you. And I don't want you to just be concerned about your own eternity. I want you to be concerned about those that don't know Jesus. So as concerned as I am about you and want to help you grow in your walk with the Lord, we need to live our lives investing in others as well because 2 Corinthians 5 and 20 says that we are ambassadors of Christ. It's as if God were pleading through us for people to be reconciled to God. We're instruments of the king. We're jars of clay that have a treasure hidden in them. And we need to let that treasure be known. Amen? Because we don't take a light and we don't hide it under a bush. We let it shine. Amen? So whatever it is that's going to stretch you and make you uncomfortable, it's time to step up. It's time to do it because church is not somewhere you go. It's who you are. You are the body of Christ. And every part has its, its individual part to play, but it helps move the collective body of Christ forward. Amen, church? Amen. Word of grace is just one instrument that the Lord uses. There are many other churches. There's many other Christians, and they're all made up of all these people that God cares about individually on a micro level. But then he also sees the big picture and he sees eternity. We make a bigger impact together. So let's glorify God this Easter by focusing on living like eternity matters. Instead of just going through the motions. This Palm Sunday as we begin to think about his death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus wept over them because they didn't get it. Thanks for listening to this sermon from Word of Grace. For more sermons or any other information, visit WOGCC.com.